Uh, so my name is Troy Sutton. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Veterinary and Biomedical Sciences uh, within the College of Agriculture. And the research in my lab uh, really focuses on how uh, viruses in animals uh, cross into humans and then transmit onwards. So I'm really interested in how pandemics occur. Uh, and then the other side of this is I'm also really interested in developing vaccines against these viruses and also better vaccines in general, uh, specifically for viruses such as influenza and, and COVID. Uh, and Penn State really recruited me to work on these exotic uh, emerging viruses in their high containment lab. So uh, the title of my talk today is your annual flu shot, how our knowledge of influenza vaccines is shaping COVID vaccine development. All right, so influenza or flu is a big problem. It is a global disease. Uh, it does not discriminate. It infects the young, the old, uh, the healthy, uh, and uh, the rich and the poor. It is a disease, uh, a virus that affects everybody. Uh, these are statistics from the CDC from 2017, 2018. That year there was uh, anywhere from 9 million to 45 million uh, people infected with influenza that year anywhere from 140 to 800,000 hospitalizations and 12,000 to 61,000 deaths. Uh, and uh, our best defense against influenza is vaccination. There are antiviral medications, but they really uh, do not compare to a good vaccine. In terms of how your flu vaccine works, hopefully everybody has gotten their intramuscular vaccine, their flu vaccine this year. This is an intramuscular vaccine, it's in your arm. And the goal of the vaccine is to induce these molecules called antibodies. Uh, and this vaccine does a good job of inducing these in the blood. Uh, and the idea here is that when you see a flu virus, uh, these antibodies bind to and coat that virus and prevent it from infecting you. <clears throat> uh, now I made the point that this vaccine does a good job of inducing antibodies in the blood. And if you look at how blood is distributed throughout the body, this is a, a map of blood distribution, you see that your lungs are really well vascularized. There's lots of blood flowing to your lungs. But if you look at your face, uh, and, and particularly your nose, where you encounter flu in your upper respiratory tract, there's not a lot of blood flow there. So these vaccines do a good job of protecting your lungs, but not a great job at protecting your nose. In terms of why we need a flu vaccine every year, well, this has to do with the biology of the virus. Flu, during its replication, intentionally mutates. It purposefully makes mistakes. Uh, so this is a schematic of somebody infected with a flu virus, uh, and they're going to shed viruses. And we say colloquially that they shed a mutant swarm of viruses. Every one of these viruses carries a mutation in it. And so what happens is when uh, that virus or that swarm of viruses encounters antibodies, uh, some of these can escape. They've mutated enough that they're not recognized by antibodies. That virus then goes on and becomes the dominant strain. And so because we sporadically have these escape mutants, um, you need, the vaccine needs to be updated uh, regularly. <coughs> In terms of how we pick which strain makes up the vaccine, uh, this is done uh, based on some important biology of the virus. So uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, the flu season runs October to March. And in the Southern Hemisphere, it runs April through September. And there are laboratories distributed throughout both hemispheres that collaborate with the World Health Organization. And they collect strains that are circulating. They isolate influenza viruses from people. Uh, using that knowledge based on the strains they isolate, they then uh, determine or they, they predict which virus is going to predominate the next year. So based on the viruses that are circulating in the Southern Hemisphere, they predict which strain is gonna go on and circulate what happens in the Northern Hemisphere and vice versa. They then ask of these predicted strains, does our current vaccine, do the antibodies in our current vaccine recognize those predicted strains? If uh, the vaccine antibodies don't recognize those predicted strains, they update the vaccine. Do flu vaccines work? Uh, the truth is they don't work well enough. Uh, this is the figure from the CDC. This is the percent uh, efficacy of these vaccines. 
This is every year from 2005 to last year. And you can see that the efficacy ranges from 21 to 60% or even 19. So that means that in a bad year, the vaccine protects two out of 10 people and in a good year, six out of 10. And that is, is really far less than ideal. But what this doesn't tell you, what's hidden in here is that uh, when you look at people that are hospitalized with severe flu infections, the people that survive are the people that are vaccinated. The people that tend to develop very severe disease and die are the people that were not vaccinated. So these vaccines, even though they may not be very good at preventing you from getting infected, they do do a pretty good job of protecting you from death. Uh, these vaccines also do reduce transmission to others, but they do not block, block transmission. So vaccination is a way of helping to reduce the spread and it, it can protect or, or limit your spread to other people, particularly if you're around young children uh, or the elderly. In terms of reasons why flu vaccines uh, fail, why they don't always work, uh, sometimes we simply guess wrong. They say, well, this is the strain we think is gonna predominate and a different strain predominates. Uh, as mentioned in, in the starting video, uh, in the state of Pennsylvania, there is a very large vaccine production industry uh, these vaccines are all produced in eggs. Sometimes when we put our vaccine strain into eggs, it mutates slightly. And when that vaccine is then administered to a human, uh, the antibodies that it induces are not able to recognize the predominant strain that circulates. Some other caveats to the vaccine. Uh, this vaccine really only targets one protein on the virus. So this is a schematic of an influenza virus. This protein is called the hemagglutinin. Uh, and, and this is the target of these vaccines. But there are other proteins as well that we could target. And there are also proteins inside the virus that we could target. Uh, and again, the vaccine really does a good job of protecting your lungs, but it doesn't uh, really protect your nose. In terms of uh, what the research community is doing, there is a global effort to develop what we call a universal influenza vaccine. And this is being driven or spearheaded by the National Institute of Health, or sorry, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is part of the National Institute of Health. Uh, this is their strategic plan launched in 2017. Uh, and the goal, I like to use a Lord of the Rings reference, is to develop one vaccine to rule them all. So one vaccine that will protect you against all flu strains. And this plan is quite comprehensive and, and I have to actually commend the NIH on it because not only did they say we want you to engineer new vaccine formulations, they said we want you to understand influenza transmission. We don't really understand it that well. And we want to understand if other vaccine components other than this single component we're focused on can block transmission. And so in terms of what is Penn State doing about it, uh, these are research efforts in my lab. Uh, we are actually looking at those questions. Can other vaccine components block transmission? Uh, and can uh, different routes, so if we vaccinate in the nose, can that block transmission? So just to walk you through this a little bit more, uh, the best animal model for influenza are ferrets. All of your flu vaccines uh, are tested in ferrets. Uh, in ferrets, if we inoculate them with a virus, uh, we can house them in a way that they uh, share the same airspace with another ferret, but don't actually have direct contact. And the virus reliably transmits from one ferret to the other through the air. And so, uh, you know, for COVID, this has been, been quite controversial. Is the virus airborne transmissible? Uh, for flu, it is very clearly an airborne transmissible virus. So what we are doing is we're asking the question, well, what if we vaccinate against, against different components? We take this other surface protein, the neuraminidase, or there's other proteins, the M protein, internal proteins. What if we give intramuscular vaccines against those? Does that alter transmission? And then as well, what we're asking is, well, instead of giving this in the arm, in the, the muscle or the, the leg of the ferret or the arm of a human, what if we give it in the nose? What if you vaccinate the nose, the area where you actually encounter flu viruses, can you get better protection? And we have good evidence that this, this is gonna work, but this really needs to be optimized. We need, we need better, more clear evidence on how best to vaccinate the nose. Okay, so uh, we're in a, a virtual Zoom tour, and that is because we are in the middle of a global uh, pandemic. Uh, this virus, SARS coronavirus, emerged in uh, late December, early January in China, 
It went on to cause a pandemic that was declared in, in March. Uh, and to date, uh, these are numbers from last night, this virus has infected over 32 million people and caused almost a million deaths. In terms of how our flu vaccine knowledge is shaping COVID vaccine development, well, the first is picking the vaccine target. So this is the influenza virus. Again, we target this surface protein, the hemagglutinin. And we know if you can induce a really good immune response against this hemagglutinin, uh, that you can protect, protect against severe disease. And so the same approach is being applied with COVID. They're targeting this protein called the S protein, which is very analogous to the same protein on flu. And as well, because of our knowledge of flu, that really, if you can start incorporating more uh, viral components into your vaccine, uh, and that might improve your vaccine, that same approach is being applied to COVID, uh, where other proteins are going to be incorporated, such as this orange protein and this yellow protein. These additional proteins will be incorporated in subsequent generations of vaccines, not the vaccines that are being uh, developed right now. So in terms of the first generation of COVID vaccines, in terms of what to expect, there are two or three candidates that are in late stage clinical trials. These are all being given intramuscularly. They're gonna induce antibodies in your blood. And we've done studies here where we've induced high levels of antibodies against uh, this S protein in the blood of, of animals. And we can show that this doesn't protect the nose. When you have high levels of these antibodies, you can still infect the nose. So we do expect that these first generation vaccines, that they will reduce disease. We do expect that they'll reduce hospitalizations. And right now this is good enough. This is what the world needs. We need the disease burden to be reduced. Uh, it is unlikely that they will block or prevent transmission of uh, COVID or SARS coronavirus. In terms of what else we're doing, uh, I like to say we're hitting COVID where it counts. Uh, we are developing second generation vaccines and working to understand the biology of these viruses or this virus. Uh, so before I came here, Penn State built a state-of-the-art high containment laboratory, uh, specifically with the focus on uh, responding and preparing for pandemics. And they recruited me to work in that laboratory. This picture of me working in that lab. <clears throat> and working with a collaborator, uh, we're developing what we call a nasal virus mimicking vaccine. My collaborator is Dr. Scott Minner. So this again is a, is a SARS coronavirus. This vaccine is basically a protein buckyball. It looks like sort of a protein soccer ball. And we can uh, graft proteins onto it. So we're grafting this S protein onto it, we can graft other proteins onto it. Uh, and what's important is that this vaccine is almost exactly the same size as a coronavirus. And when you decorate it with these proteins, it looks very much like a coronavirus to the immune system. The other feature we're doing is we are incorporating uh, additional parts to this vaccine to try and make it induce an even better antibody response. So we're gonna add additional components to make it induce a better antibody response. And then we're gonna give it intranasally. We're gonna vaccinate the areas where you first encounter uh, coronaviruses. Uh, the other area of research that we're exploring, uh, and this is NIH funded work, is we're looking at how long immunity to SARS coronavirus lasts. Uh, this is a very hot topic in the, in the, in the news. Uh, there are reports of people getting reinfected uh, with these viruses. So in animal models, we're either vaccinating them or giving them coronavirus, we're letting them develop antibodies, and then at time intervals up to four months after they were infected, we're attempting to reinfect these animals. And this is gonna be really important for guiding how often you need to get vaccinated, when people can again become at risk for infection. And so we're actually quite excited about this work. Okay, and so I'll conclude with some remarks. Um, the last is that the flu vaccine can save you. Uh, it is not perfect, but again, it can keep you out of the morgue. Uh, we fully anticipate that there will be the, the COVID pandemic will continue through the fall and there will be a flu epidemic layered on top of that. Uh, there are COVID vaccines being developed, but they're unlikely to be ready for the, this fall. Uh, and so your flu vaccine can save you and save lives. Uh, and so this is a, a promotional material from the CDC. Uh, and I will make one more comment about the flu vaccine is that getting your flu vaccine uh, if it does reduce your disease severity, you're less likely to go to the doctor, you're less likely to go to hospital, and uh, so that's where you're less likely to, to encounter COVID. And so with that, I have some concluding remarks or some credits. Uh, I need to credit the College of Agriculture for uh, 
bringing me to Penn State and supporting me and a lot of other funding institutions. Uh, and one other disclaimer, I don't get any CDC funding or vaccine manufacturer funding.